everybody. Welcome, everybody. This is the, I'm Tim Allen. This is the 530 finance meeting. Typical that we have, similar meeting that we have before every regular meeting. The difference this time is that we've also take, uh, they asked us to take the issue with the fort, which went to the maintenance and development committee. And that's item one on this agenda, I believe. And, and I've been in several conversations on it and would like to get started with it, but it's really not my issue. Uh, Sean Curran is the chair of the maintenance and development. So we'll work on it together, but he's not gonna be here for a couple of couple minutes. Yeah. So, okay. all right, I'm Sean, Malo, um, So let me just make sure we know what we have here. Uh, Chris Signoli, you're on? Yep. Great. Um, Kateri's on. Um, The Deputy Chief Lawrence Akers. Here. Thank you. Um, appreciate everybody being on here. We're just, you know, working through this new technology. Um, Walsh's iPad, that must be you, Catery. I'm sorry, did you say something to me? It says Walsh's iPad, that must be you. <laughs> on our thing here, so we'll, we'll assume that's you. Uh, Kathy? Me. Okay. It's Kathy, Kathy. Kathy Bono. Okay, great, Kathy. Are you in, are you on for a finance item or for the Ford item? No, no, for finance. I have uh, five grants on. Okay, great. We're not getting to them just yet. Um, City Clerks is on. Councilor Click Bruce is on. Deputy Chief Lawrence Akers. Justin, are you on? It says you're here. Can you hear us, Justin? Yes, I can. <laughs> great. great, welcome, thank you. Um, Deputy Chief Lawrence Akers, I guess that's it, as far as I can Tracy is on. Oh, Tracy's on now, okay. So uh, the main item that has been getting the most discussion is the Ford, and I've been in several conversations on that. Sean Curran is the chair of that committee, and he just called me, said he'd be a few minutes no, late. He's, he's right here. Just made it. Oh, just made it. Yeah, all right, good. So, <laughs> oh, and Tim. so we can, and Ken Shea is here. Great. Um, so why don't we start with item one, Sean? That is, uh, that's your item. Sure. So on the maintenance and development committee, uh, we are taking up a Fort Street petition uh, to uh, allow outdoor dining. And I know uh, if he be, uh, w Director Chris Cignoli on the line. So, uh, Chris, if you can uh, enlighten the, the committee as to sure. the and what it'll do and how we'll do it. Sure. Um, just for everybody's purposes, obviously, back when the pandemic started in 2020, the state put together rules and regulations for outdoor dining uh, that allowed a lot of relaxing of the rules, specifically related to uh, alcohol consumption. Uh, historically, your outdoor space had to be immediately contiguous to your parcel or to your building, uh, that changed. So many businesses and restaurants throughout the city uh, applied through the program for the city and uh, did the outdoor dining. We probably did somewhere between 20 and 30. Uh, some businesses continued to do it, some didn't. Obviously the Ford is one of those locations that has continued. In January of this year, the rules and regulations for the pandemic, it was getting well known that they were going to be expiring so what the state did was the rules expired. However, the state ex um, modified the regulation that turned all of the approvals back to the local level uh, for allowing outdoor dining. The city has an outdoor dining ordinance. However, it is uh, mostly rated to on-site uh, and use of immediate sidewalk. Uh, this one was a little different uh, as the fort wanted to continue to use Fort Street. Uh, they've done it for three years. This will be their fourth year. Uh, the idea of closing the roadway for the year can be done through a permit process through the DPW. What the intent was, though, is that the fort wanted to get approval, uh, and I don't want to use the word permanently, but basically to do the closures every year uh, from roughly May 1st to November 1st. Uh, the only caveat that we've ever had with this, that as long as all of the vendors and, uh, excuse me, not vendors, property owners on the street were on board with it, uh, and we do that for all closures, as long as that's the case, everything is good. So the idea of this process 
was to get their approval so that basically every year they come back to the DPW, uh, go through a quick permit process, get everything all set, rather than going through a full review every year. The setup that they're doing is basically the same that they've done for the last three or four years. The sidewalks that are on both sides of the uh, uh, dining area remain open for the public. Um, and um, the approval, I believe they started somewhere after May 1st with uh, uh, closing the roadway down there. Uh, we can, as the DPW, can give them a permit. For an extended period of time, what we suggested was that they make an application to the Board of Public Works. Uh, so the Board of Public Works had their meeting uh, on May 1st of this year, or excuse me, the meeting was on May 15th, and then uh, uh, it was approved and referred to the council, obviously, at last week's meeting. So the idea of this, the DPW has the authority to grant it for a period of time, but the idea for a longer period was to go through the Board of Public Works and then the council to be able to get that approval so it can move forward every year. And so, as I said, the only caveat associated with that is that there are issues with abutters who do not uh, approve of the closure. And we do that for all closures around the city. Uh, if people object to it for, for any reason, um, we don't allow it. However, in this case, all the abutters are on board. They've been on board for three years and we haven't had any issues with it. Uh, around the city, I have had a handful of other applicants who have inquired uh, for outdoor dining. And basically we are running them through a similar process that we did for the state process, which is you show us where you want to be. You show us the layout of your tables. You show us the layout of your chairs. How are people going to be protected? And you will get approval. Uh, the only entity that I'm actively working with right now is Asteria um, uh, around the corner on Bridge Street. However, outdoor places such as um, um, Jackalope uh, and a few others and uh, Theodore's as an example of being into the public way are applications that I also expect to see this year. So the idea of running it through the Board of Public Works was to get approval. So not to have to jump through the uh, the application process every year. Just so Chris, it, the petitioners would have to come back to the city in some shape or form every year. Am I correct there? Yeah, they, they come back to me. And what I would ask them is, is, you know, double check with all your butters, make sure everybody's on board, yeah. you know, layout's going to be the same as it has been in the past. Yes, no, what's going to change uh, uh, and, and then allow them if there is any change and then allow them to be able to move forward with it. So I, I think that was a, a problem with some counselors because it, it was represented that if this passed, uh, it would be permanent forever, but there is the, the petitioners will have to come back to the city. So there is oversight that everything's going to We'll be have a conversation with them every, you know, January, February, uh, so they can go through and get their paperwork because we will then issue them a new permit for each calendar year. That they and, there. Could you just quickly explain to the committee, if this isn't done, what, what are the committees that you have to go to, to, to get the outdoor dining for any restaurant? They'd have to go through DBW. They'd have to go through uh, DBW health, uh, licensing because yeah. they do have to get approvals for their liquor for modification of their liquor license. Um, that was all taken care of in the past. At that, it was, I don't want to, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the right word, it was just allowed, uh, not to be contiguous to your parcels. Uh, and that's changed that allows the municipality to uh, look at that application and allow the uh, alcohol consumption. And when they also have to go through the police department as well? They have to go through police, police, fire, building, code, all those entities take a look at these things. So there'd be four or five different entities that, yeah. that the petitioners would not have to go, yeah. uh, go yeah, through. Yeah, we double check. We double check with all the different departments to make sure that there is nothing, you know, number one becomes alcohol, obviously, uh, to make sure that they are on board with their uh, with their correct licensing. And I think there was something else that was unclear in the last council meeting. The way the petition was written, there was a significant amount of language that brought in utilities, uh, yes. extraneous language. Yes. And, um, yeah, there, there, there is still some of that language in there. Some of it is absolutely boilerplate that comes out of the Board of Public Works. But there was also some bad cutting and pasting. As a matter of fact, I think the title even said underground utilities. Uh, but really now what the intent is, is closing it for... May 1st, November 1st, and or when weather starts to get bad, you know, I keep in touch with all the people at the fort and they keep in touch with us about uh, opening it back up and, um, you know, as far as moving forward throughout the year. 
Thank you. So that answers my questions. I know we have other counselors on the line with uh, some questions. Uh, so uh, if we can, I'll, I'm going to go from the screens that I see in the, the in the blocks that I see here at City Hall, and I see Tracy Whitfield in the first block. So Tracy, uh, go right. I am ahead. City Councilor Tracy Whitfield. Um, if one is going to be addressed as counselor, please address us all as counselor. I just wanted to say that because some people get the counselor title and others don't. I'm Counselor Tracy Whitfield. Sure. Um, um, so Chris, no, actually, Ken, Shay, yeah. yeah, I would like to know more about the process and the rules behind it, because I think I didn't understand, um, the language as far as what needs to go to, um, the board of commissioners and what needs to come to the city council. So can you just explain that? And can you also give your legal opinion on what you think about closing it indefinitely because the wording says indefinitely I don't care where they have to go annually I think that it's a benefit to us if organizations on some type of basis whether it's biannually or every three years are re-inspected to make sure things are um, being done appropriately so if you could just um, talk to the process first and then I'll, I'll ask some additional questions Okay, let me take, I'm going to take the second part first because it's the easiest. And that is that, as been pointed out, every year they basically have to apply for a new permit. Okay, so the permit that's issued, if it is issued this year, will be from May 1 to November 1st. And after that, next year, they'll have to come back in and go through the process of reapplying to get another permit. So there's no permanent permanent. Okay, it's not once this is passed, it isn't infinitum and goes on for years without coming back to the council um to your second to your so first hold on question. one one minute um attorney shay um so what so if they have to come back every year what are we doing so if they have to come back every year anyway what are we doing right now what is the point of so this right now right now what we'd be doing is granting a permit so that they can operate this season between may and november Okay. And then next season, because that's that wasn't my understanding, and that was the concern. If they have to come back every year, that's not really um, a concern. The concern was that it was going to be an indefinite process where they wouldn't have to come back to the council and go through the licensing procedures every year. The statute doesn't allow that. So what uh, Mr. Signoli pointed out is he would simplify the process because every year they're going to be doing the very same thing. And so as long as there's no changes, they would go through their process and they would issue another permit. But if they don't apply, say they get one for this year and they don't come back in next year for another one, then they can't operate without a permit. So they've got to get a new permit each year in order to do this. And to get the permit just has to go through, um, what, the regular procedures? Well, it goes to the Board now? of Public Works is the way it's been done. Board of Public Works? Okay. All right, so now I totally don't understand why we're doing this at all, but... Um, well, we're doing this tonight, Tracy, because they need a permit for this year. But what couldn't the Board of Public Works just have approved that like they've been doing the last three years? So why is it in front of the City Council? Because, well, I'll take that, Ken, because in the past it was allowed by state leg the legislative uh, changes that were done at the state, and now yeah. that that has expired, it has to be approved at the local level. So that indefinite part is just is not a legal process, then is what we're saying. Right. They're going to come back to what I'm looking. I can I can grant them a permit every year without going through the city council. Mm -hmm. And what I am looking to do is to get this approved by the council so that they just have to go through the permit process every year. And uh, so we're just trying to simplify it. I can grant them a permit every year for partial closure of a street for a certain period of time that does not have to go through the Board of Public Works. Mm -hmm. All I'm trying to do is get this approved so that every year we're just going through a simplified permit process. And that could be for any of the entities um, because what the state has done now is they've turned the rules and regs back to the, uh, back to the cities for enforcement. Okay, Chris, so since we're talking about the simplified process, give us a little bit of knowledge on what the simplified process will look like as opposed to the full process. They're going to be submitting a permit application to me. We'll probably meet with them January, February. What's your table layout? What dates? Uh, alcohol, 
because depending upon the licensing, and I'm not familiar with that, but depending upon how the licensing is granted, it may only be for a year. They got to get a new alcohol license uh, and all the submissions that have to put in there. Fire department, police department have to review it to make sure that it's accessible and uh, meets all of the code information. And that's what we went through for all of the applicants that uh, made the application for outdoor dining under the state process. So that's the full process. That's the process that I'm going to expect from them every year and any other applicant. So what's different? Oh, you're just trying to get it approved because it's a local. Right. Uh, it's a right. local. I, I have to do that because now it's under local control. So therefore, uh, you know, if, if an entity wanted to close it for a week, I can grant that. But since they're doing it for an extended period of time, I have to get the approval of the Board of Public Works and the City Council to be able to do that over an extended period of time. So going forward, they would only have to go to you and you would do the approval. It wouldn't have to go to the Board of Public Works and it wouldn't have to go to the City Council. Correct. That, Correct. So those are the two steps that are um, that you're trying to avoid. Right. And that's that's basically kind of change the rules and regs that the state changed following the uh, COVID guidance that they modified the rules for outdoor dining. Okay, so thank you for answering that. Um, my next question is for the finance team. Um, do we charge any taxes or fees? Um, we've been giving out such a large amount of money. Are we getting anything in um, from these local businesses that want to do that? Is it an extension of their property? Um, no. Oh, sorry, Chris. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lindsay. I was just going to say um, no. From the finance side. There's nothing specific we do that would just probably all, I don't know if there's a cost for the permit or whatever Chris charges, but no. Yeah, and, and from our side, Counselor, we've just been doing minimal fees. Uh, you know, you, you heard things about Boston and Hartford charging five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000. we are doing minimal fees for any entity that wants to be within the public way uh, mm -hmm. for any sort of outdoor dining. That's nice for them, but I wish we would have the same consideration when it comes to the property tax of our residents, residential taxpayers, Chris. I'm, I'm happy for the uh, small business owners around here, but um, if we do such great consideration for our residents, that would be even more welcoming. Mm -hmm. um, so then I got another question, but it's more for the uh, petitioner. Are they here? Yes, they yeah. are. Okay, um, my question for them is, so when I was looking at the state laws and the um, rules online, they were talking about like um, for handicap accessibility and things like that. Have you guys, is that written into your program? Because that was definitely something that was um, mandated um, by the state. And Chris, I would also like to know if that was written into any documentation that you um, are reviewing. Uh, Peter, I'll let you answer first on that. There's handicap accessible entrance and exits for the restaurant on Main Street. Um, so the answer is yes. Entrance to the restaurant. And so the restaurant when you talk and, to, and on the sidewalk getting to the restaurant. So getting so the access from the outdoor dining facility and getting into the restaurant to maybe use the restroom and all that, all that has been worked out into your plan. Yes. Okay. And then my final question for you, Chris, is so when we're doing like roadway, um, when we're doing roadway improvements and things like that in the area, how, how is that going to be handled? Are we going to like just um, give special privileges on the roadways when they're done for a certain area or community? How, how are we going to how are we going to figure that out? Well, at, in this particular case, we actually paved Fort Street three years ago. Mm -hmm. I can't remember when we were doing it because it was one of the streets that was on our list to do. Uh, and we actually, uh, I, I want to say, had to go into a little bit of May before we were able to get that done, uh, but got it done early in the year. Any of these locations where there's public way stuff, for example, Theodore's, we expanded their sidewalk uh, as part of the uh, money that was provided by the state. However, before that was expanded, they had the same thing. They were actually out in the street doing their uh, doing their dining in the street level and on the sidewalk. So we coordinate with whoever happens to be doing, you know, for example, Bridge Street, you know, if we end up having to do some pavement work on Bridge Street, what I would want to do is do it before or after 
um, you know, the season of where they have their outdoor dining to be able to get any work done. If there's an emergency, if there's an emergency, we're going to end up having to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, you know that I am an equitable person. And when we're doing special favors for uh, different entities and different restaurants, when it comes up in different neighborhoods and different entities and different restaurants, I hope that we consider doing the same special treatments when it comes to roadways, outdoor dining and everything. So I have one more question. I promise this is my final question. But for some of the entities that got ARPA fund for outdoor dining program, I rolled by them and they technically don't have the space. So are we going to be bumping out sidewalks um, for those um, loca locations or you, you, you're not sure how that's going to work yet? Well, for example, I, as I mentioned before, Osteria contacted me right away and said that they wanted to do something outdoor, similar to what Theodore's had done a number of years ago, getting into the street. Mm -hmm. And so I asked them, I said, you give us a plan, you give us the layout, where everything's going to be laid out, how it's going to be protected, how, you know, how citizens are still going to be able to walk up and down the sidewalk. Haven't gotten that back from them yet. Mm -hmm. But on all of the entities that we provided permits to over the last two, three years as part of the pandemic, all of them had to provide us a plan, a layout, whether they were on their own property or not, because some of these businesses, if the, even if they're on their own property, still have to go through, it, it's not in the public right away, but they still need to come through us to get approval for safety purposes and things like that. And I always use like Texas Roadhouse up on Cooley Street, you know, expanded into the parking lot, but you got to show me you can do that safely and it's protected. So what we get back are those plans showing layout, where your table is going to be, number of people, how it's protected. Uh, how are you going to take care of trash? How are you going to uh, deal with alcohol? All that stuff comes into us. And Asteria is the only one that contacted us so far, and we gave them all that info. Uh, and I haven't seen anything back from them, but it's only been about 10 days or so. Well, I'm glad you said that because I think the outdoor dining um, ARPA awards, and this is nothing toward you directly, mm -hmm. Chris, this is for the public and for the record, it was prematurely done. If these um, organizations don't even have approval for outdoor dining, I don't understand how they would be awarded outdoor dining funds or um, grant yet. I think that was prematurely done, and I think it was done purposefully. Um, and so that's just for the record, and that will conclude my remarks, um, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And next uh, in the queue, we have City Councilor Justin Hurst. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Chris, couple couple questions relating to the street closure. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess I, like Councilor Whitfield, are a bit confused as to whether you're coming before us for the street closure or whether you're coming before us to avoid having to go through a permit process. What do you exactly, what does the city council have jurisdiction over that causes you to come before us? The city council has jurisdiction over closure of a roadway for an extended period of time. Uh, That's what I thought. Yeah, and that's that's what we're looking for. Is since it's for an extended period of time, uh, I want to make sure. What I don't want to have happen is all of a sudden in September, people are saying, "How come they get a per how come wh whoever gets a permit that you know one guy's closing it for three weeks, one guy's closing it for six months?" We want to be able to have it so that they can close the road during the period of time that they are requesting, uh, and the permit the permits that they need obviously come through us and other departments as well. Uh, to be able to grant that each year moving forward. So we we don't have anything to do with the granting of the permits. Granting we, of the permit, it, no, it's just, I, it is for the road closure itself. So the only reason you're coming before us is for the road closure, correct? Right. Correct. So, so what jurisdiction do you have over closing the roads? And where can I find that? Uh, where, where, where can I find that? Um, in the statute. I'll, I'll leave what, what, where you can find it up to esteemed attorney Shea. Uh, however, we close roadways. I'm, I'm going to say all of the time. However, we have a, a process in the city that requires, whether you're looking for a day or two, a week, a month, whatever, uh, what you have to go through to get that permit and what you have to do, go through to get that approval. If you are looking to, you know, close it for a one day for a block party or for three days because you're doing construction or a week because of a major project that you're doing, 
you need to submit to us a road closure plan, how it's going to be protected. I need to get approval from police, fire, ambulance, schools, um, anybody else that's involved, depending upon what the closure type is, uh, and be able to grant that for a period of time through our occupancy manual. And our occupancy manual, there's it lists everything in there with regard to road closures that we do around the city um, on a daily basis. So for example, if we're talking about construction and we need to close a road for a day, we have a process in place of what they have to do and get all the signatures for that. So, so for me, what I need to know is when does city council approval kick in? Um, you when, said extended period. You said I'm extended sorry, period. What of I would time. say is we're trying to make this. I I, I don't want to use the word permanent. But rather than them coming before the city council every year to request it, because I consider this to be an extended period of time. So yeah, I, rather than I, coming I would... before the council every year, I want, to, I want to have that approval. And then they go through the permit process every year. I think, we, I think we're, we're getting things a bit convoluted because we start talking about the road coaches in conjunction with the, um, with the permitting process. And so I, I, I don't really care about the permitting process. I care about when does your jurisdiction over closing of the road stop? And at what point in time is it necessary for folks to come to the city council? And that's the only language that I want to have. Um, all of the other stuff, as far as I'm concerned, is not relevant. Um, and so that, Attorney Shea, was what I talked to you earlier about. That's what I want to know. And it seems to me, I, I keep hearing this, you, you don't want to come back before the city council every year, but if that's the case, then you're asking us to close this road indefinitely. And so I, that, that, that you're saying multiple things to me right now, and I don't, I don't quite get it. Um, when does so th so those are my questions when does jurisdiction kick in for the city council that requires us to approve it um and when does yours end and and and, and even more importantly when do you have authority like is it authority to um you know is it authority during construction time is it authority during special events and 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 when does that end and did you have the authority to close this street down unilaterally for folks to operate a business because it's already closed down. Yep. So I need that and I, I want to see that in writing. And I, I can't make a, I don't think anybody can make an informed decision until they see it because I know I can't just go out here and just start closing Parker Street down and, you know, parking my car in front of Parker Street you know, I, I, I just because I want to, you know, I want to do business like it. I don't understand that. And so, you know, I, I, I just I, I, I'm I'm assuming that you're coming before us a little late and that some of this stuff has already been executed. I have a significant problem with that. I just want to know whether you've been able to do what it is that you're doing legally. That's I, all have I, the, know. I have the authority to close roads temporarily in the city through a permit process. And, and, and so I guess I just want to see, and I guess if, if you have authority to close roads so that a business can make more money, I, I, I just, that to me seems a bit outside of your boundaries, but I, I you know, and, and how long does that last? And was that the case last year? Or are you saying that state law came into play and allowed and gave you more authority over the closures of the roads? State law gave to me greater right. authority to the city to do all sorts of different approvals under the it, outdoor dining proposal or outdoor dining law that had been put in place. I, I, I would like to see it. I don't know if that's as relevant now. I can um, answer. Well, you can answer, attorney? Yeah, we got someone here to answer. Uh, Justin? Yeah, 
I'm listening. Yeah, Ken Shea. So um, after we talked, I went back and I went into the city regulations of all the regulations that are codified by the city of Springfield that at some point were probably passed by the city council. And in those regulations, the Department of Public Works, um, and I can give you a copy of it, um, and I can email it to you. Um, the Department of Public Works uh, has authority for closing streets and they have three different categories. Um, there's the street occupancy category, which what we're dealing with. Uh, there's a trenching permit, which we're not concerned about. And in those regulations, it in indicates that the Department of Public Works has got the authority to close streets, especially for when it's going to be an extended period of time. And it requires the Department of Public Works to hold public hearings and to get input from the public and deal with the abutters. And once that petition that's been filed with the Department of Public Works has been approved by the Department of Public Works, the Department of Public Works then petitions the city council as they did at the meeting we had last week and probably tonight for approval of that permit to close the street. What Chris is doing is trying to pick up on that and say, once that's been done, we'd like to simplify the process going forward. If nothing changes, we'll review the permit and make think, sure things are in order. But there is language within the city statutes that gives that authority to the Department of Public Works to close streets, dealing with construction, whatever they want to, you know, parades, uh, one day issues, and what we're doing here. So those authorities are outlined in the city and I'll give you a copy of it. Attorney Shea, how long has this street been closed? How long has this street been closed? Yeah. I have no idea how long it's been closed. That's a great question. Yeah. Does anybody know how long they're this street has been closed for? They're petitioning to close it, I believe, from May 1 to November 1st. That's, Attorney that's, Shea, how long has this street been closed for? Oh, I, I, I can't answer that. I don't the last know. Three years. For the last three it's years? Been... <laughs> are, you, are you talking this year or are you talking in general? Attorney Shea, I think the petitioner just answered my question. Okay. The oh, street has been closed for the last three years. Okay. An extended period of time, I'm sure, has been triggered. I'm sure it was triggered a long time ago. The idea that we're coming before the city council now, after the street has been closed for an extended period of time, and asking us permission after the fact, it's it, problematic. Well, I think, Justin, the, the the first couple of years it was closed was under the state regulations. And those regulations have terminated. And that's why we're now in the process, if I understand, um, from Mr. Signoli and Mr. Pignelli. Attorney Shea, when did yes. those regulations, when did those state regulations terminate? I'd have to ask Chris because I did not research that. I think it Chris. was I think it was April 30th when the uh uh emergency um the state stopped all their emergency rules and regulations associated with COVID. So that street has been closed. And I I, I bet you if I go back and look, I, I I bet you I I bet you a lot on it that it did not give you that the state did not give the city unilateral jurisdiction to close down a street for an extended period of time through those regulations. But maybe let's assume it did. It ended in April. What constitutes an extended period of time? And I think a reasonable person would argue that an extended period of time is probably reached by now, April to June. What are we in? June, right? That's how long this street has been closed. Why are we just seeing this come before our desk now? I assume no one would have an answer for it. So with that said, um, I don't have any more questions. I just. I guess my only statement is I'm dumbfounded that this is allowed to happen because the petitioner wants it to happen. Like I just, and the city wants it to happen. We can just violate 
the law and just do things the way we want to do it. We are not violating any law, any law. Okay, tell me any more. Law. Tell me more. And if you if you have a law that I'm violating, let me know tonight, please. So, so if it has to come before us for an guidelines. extended period of time, Chris, it has I to have, come before the city council. What is an extended period of time? It's been closed for the last six months. No, it has not. Okay, how long has it been closed? Maybe I'm confused. I'm a just month listening and a half. It's been closed a month and a half right now. So when is an extended period? It's been closed a month and a half? I, the petitioner just said the last three years. No, it's been, we've have. done it for the summer period for oh, since 2020. May to October, under the state rules and guidelines, has been closed for the last three years. All of the entities in the city that have outdoor dining have all operated under those guidelines for three years. And those guidelines said that it gave you all jurisdiction to close down any streets you wanted for any period of time without having city council approval. That's what Absolutely. you're saying, right? Absolutely, that, yes. Okay, so, so one, I'd like to see those guidelines. If you could get those to me, that'd be great. And then two, I just want to know, I, I assume that the petitioner meant to say he closed it down for three months every year, right? Or for four months for outside dining every year. And it hasn't been closed down for the duration of the last three years. Is that accurate? Maybe the petitioner can answer. Maybe you can answer, Chris. May, that, basically, that, it's been May 1st to, Octo to October 30th, 31st, excuse me, for those three years. At the end of October, it's all weather dependent. They may have closed down a few days earlier just because the weather. So that, so that street was not blocked off until May 1st of this year. It was not closed until May 1st of this year. Is that what you're telling Correct. me? Correct. Um, I may be wrong on the exact date, but right around May 1st. Okay. And so what constitutes an extended period of time? I look at it as multiple years, and that's what we're trying to accomplish here. I have the authority to, to grant them uh closure through our permitting process i'm trying to get them approval at the council versus having to go through that bigger permit process every year you can grant them closure through our permitting what does the law say in terms of closing down a street so yeah i mean i that's that's i i i don't think the permitting process circumvents the law i just i find that hard to believe what does Councilor the law Shea just so read the law? We have the authority to do it, and we do it throughout the year, every year. Councilor Shea, can you get me the law? About I, 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 that that doesn't make sense to me. And I guess if you're doing it, why 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 do you need to do it? Why do you need to come before us? Why are you coming before us? Because I want to be if able can, to do it over multiple years and not have to go through so multiple years to you is an extended year. period of time. So you can close any street in the city for multiple. For, 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 for multiple, for how long? How long can you close a street in the city for a business to operate? Can Chris Dignoli close a street in the city through whatever permitting process you want to have? How long? And if that's not spelled out and we have control over the roads, then it's got to be spelled out. Because otherwise, Chris Dignoli gets to operate unilaterally absent of city council. So that's why I want to know what the law says, Attorney Shea. The law will tell me what it is I need to know. And I understand for some folks who haven't gone to law school, that might be difficult. But get me the law. Get me the law. I want to know what the law says, and then I want your opinion on whether we're um, on, on, on whether Chris is following the law. Because right now it doesn't, it doesn't it doesn't sound like it. It sounds like he can close the street down for a large period of time for any business to operate. That's a problem. So when I get the law, I mean, I certainly can't support it without the law. I mean, if the law says it, then I, by all means. But I need to know what the law says because this is going to have an impact on every other street closure and every other business who is looking to close down the street. Well, I, I don't right. have any more questions, Attorney Shea. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I, I need to tell you that the, the law simply gives them permission to close the street. Okay? In this case, they're asking for a permit from May 1st to November 1st. But the law, the law doesn't say what months you can close it. It says that you have authority to close the street. And then the duration of that closing is determined by the facts of the case and to what it's being done for. The law so says what it's- The law says 
oh, you can only close it from May to November. The, the authority to close the street rests with the Department of Public Works and Department of Engineering. That, and so what, why are you coming before us then, Attorney Shea? Why because, are they coming before us? Because in when a street is closed, in this case, for a period, a long period, which was considered to be from May 1 to November 1st, and it was done by the Department of Public Works, that Department of Public Works regulations requires that once they make an approval, the city council then has to approve that. So, that's so what we're doing when, here. when does the done, city yeah. when does the city council get triggered? Is all so I want to know. And when what does the, the law say? When the Department of Public Works presents a petition to the city council to authorize the closing that they want to have done. So if the Department of Public Works never comes before the presents a petition before the city council, then they can close down the street as long as they want. Why are they coming before us now? Yeah. It's because it's for because they they want it closed for an extended period of time. I just want to know where in the law it says it. It says it somewhere. And if you need more time to research, that's one thing. But it says it. I know it says it. Yeah, I've got I, it. I've got it here. I'll give you a copy of it. It, it, it. The city of Springfield gives authority for closing streets to the Department of Public Works. And, and it doesn't say in that authority certain months. It just says they have that authority to make a closing of a street. It might be Why for construction. Why are you coming be... before us, Attorney Shea? Why is it, if it gives them that authority, then why is it coming before us? I hate to belabor the point. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, but I, I, it's not it's not adding up. Why are they coming before us? They're coming before us because they need approval. I'm assuming when it when 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 there's an when it's closed for an extended period of time. What constitutes an extended period of time? That's all I want to know, and it's written down somewhere or we need to identify what an extended period of time is because I would argue that this street has already been closed for an extended period of time. I know you all just want to get to the uh, get to the approval of the extended period of time and you don't want to deal with the fact that the street has been closed down. I get that. But I'm not moving past that. The problem. And so until somebody shows me the law, um I, I certainly can't support it. And I, something is missing here, Attorney Shea, from a legal standpoint. I, I don't have it, but I know it's there. That said, Mr. Well, Chair, I, 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 do don't, I don't have it in front of me. I do have it in front of me, and it gives the, the city it gives that authority to the Department of Public Works to, to close the street. And an extended period of time, I would imagine that the individuals with the authority to close the street determine that this closure is going to be longer than what they consider a normal time, I guess. And so they're just at getting approval from the council because, again, when it was the Department of Public Works that had the petition, that required that it go to the council. That's the only reason it's in front of the council. But that's the best I can tell you. I'll give you a copy of it. Thank you. Um, thank yeah. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And so I believe, does the petitioner wish to address or? Well, I, I just want... Thank you. I just wanted to answer the question. It, we close it down. We've closed it down seasonally for the last three years. So it, it's not been permanently closed. Under, under, under the state law. Under the state law. Uh, under the state law true. and seasonally and only for outdoor dining. Now, after once it opens up the street, then opens up again and for vehicular traffic. Next in the queue, we have the councilor, city councilor Victor DeVilla. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Good afternoon to everybody, and thank you, uh, uh, Chris and Attorney Chair, for your presentation. Uh, I'm just going to know there's been lengthy discussion on this, and I'm sure that there's going to be uh, more lengthy discussion on the chambers tonight. Uh, but first, let me uh, first my question. Let me say, like I said in the last meeting, uh, I think it's a great idea. I hope it happens, uh, but I do have questions myself. Uh, and I'm going to do the due diligence that the people have entrusted me to do in the city council. Uh, I had a great conversation with Chris today. Uh, I think he uh, answered some of my questions, but um, let me ask for just to 
because I know it's a lot of people all the agenda items. I'll just give it to three questions. Uh, Chris, so the street's gonna be closed, but the average resident, Joe, Joe from the from Springfield, is still gonna be able to walk to the sidewalk and they're still gonna be able to use that street to walk. It's just the Correct. cars. All, all sidewalks on both sides are open for pedestrians to walk up and down the street. Okay, so there's still gonna be access to the public. Yes. Okay, now, I believe that uh, they say that it's going to be from May 1st to November 1st, correct? Correct. So what's going to happen after November 1st, November 2nd, what happens? Uh, the fort, as they've done the last three years, will basically dismantle everything and then open the road for normal uh, vehicular traffic. Okay, so uh, November 2nd to April 30th, cars will be able to drive by. Yep. Can they ask for an extension if they choose to? Yeah, but at that point, you're dealing with weather, you're dealing with all sorts of different things. It ends up not being, you know, sitting outside when it's 40 degrees isn't that pleasant. So basically, we've been looking at it for the spring, summer months and early fall. Yeah. Right, right, right. I do. Uh, those were the two main questions that I had, the questions that I was very uh, anxious about. I think my colleagues do bring up all the questions that are very uh, noteworthy, uh, but at least to me, uh, the uh, free uh, the access, the public access to the public uh, is paramount. Uh, but if I may, Mr. Pignelli, I have a question for you, sir. And thank you for being here. Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, great establishment. I enjoyed many of the cold beverages, sir, that are served there. <laughs> but uh, I know for a fact that in the past there has been barriers there, which look kind of nice. I know they have flower pots. It looks very nice. It's very trendy. I love the concept. Um, but I keep hearing, even in this meeting, uh, of our boss being there blocking the street. Can you comment on that? Um, sure. Um, it, it, the, the street is closed. At, at, the, at the end of the tent, yeah. we do have entertainment. We have a stage there that we we have entertainment on weekends, and after the entertainment, there there is a double decker bus that's parked there just as a visual. It's part of the decoration. It it doesn't move. It's it's not mobile. It it's it's part of how we decorate the street for outdoor dining. I have not seen the bus myself recently, but is that bus right on Main and Fourth Street, or is it? into fourth street itself it's into the fourth street itself it's um, so me yeah. like i'm sorry i didn't hear you is he blocking is he look looking down the bus away from main street or is he like blocking fourth street itself it would be on the western end of fourth street um maybe 40 yards from the entranceway, it blocks the street so that diners, the purpose of it is one decoration, but also to, so when you're out, when they're having outdoor dining, they're there, they have a visual versus looking at right. cars. So like, is that, uh, Mr. Pignelli, is that going to impede with the uh, walkability of the public? It, it does not encroach on the sidewalks at all. Okay, very well. Um, okay. Uh, those are my questions. I do look forward to continue to hear more uh, uh, robust uh, discussion on this. Uh, again, um, gentlemen, great concept. I personally like it. Uh, a lot of my questions, I'm encouraged by some of the answers that I got today. I know some of my colleagues have further questions. Uh, but um, if you allow me, Mr. Chair, if you uh, allow me real quick, uh, Ken, uh, by, if we allow this uh, to go through, are we creating a precedence for any other business coming forward? Is this going to be the new way of doing things for closures in businesses then? I don't see that because each one is, has to be independently evaluated by the Department of Public Works. So um, they're, they're so, a case by case basis. But so the first point of, of contact will be Chris at DPW. Uh, it could yes. be Chris, and then also be the other departments, the health department, fire, police. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Pignelli. Thank you.
Thank you, gentlemen. Now, Mr. Chair, those are my questions. Thank you, Councilor DeVette. Uh, we have a joint meeting today, and so we do have a robust agenda. So I know we have uh, just one more counselor, Councilor Walsh and McHugh, if you want quickly, so we get to the other items as well. And then me, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate the uh, clarification we're getting here tonight. I just want to say publicly, I like outdoor dining. I like the fort. I might even go so far to say I like Chris Signoli. Um, well, let's not get carried away. <laughs> Don't get carried away. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, and I have no problem with them getting a permit. And, and Peter, I have no problem with, with uh, the fort doing the outdoor dining, but I do feel very really strongly that it should not be a permanent permit. I feel that you, every business that's looking for the permit should have to apply every year. And I am going to support your outdoor dining this year. But I feel very strongly that every business that needs a permit should do it on a yearly basis. And there should be no blanket permission. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. With Councillor Allen, wrap up. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple kind of, couple things that came out of conversation with President Letterman earlier, since this is a maintenance and development item, and your chair of maintenance and development, and your other two members are Malo Brown and Maria Perez. I don't know if they're on this meeting. I don't see them here. Okay, so um, we need a referral from here to maintenance and development, to back to the full body. So I don't know how we're gonna do that without a quorum of maintenance and development. Well, your meeting's still continuing, so I can get a hold of them. Have them to uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I, I am actually present and I, I constitute a quorum. Oh, great. As a voting great. member. So it was your it was your um, suggestion. You want to make a motion as to what that is, Jesse, when we were talking an hour ago. Sure. I, I just a, just a well, I actually have a question, but but to speak to Councillor Allen's parliamentary point and, and uh, forgive me for being off camera at this time. But the uh, parliamentary issue is that the council voted to refer the petition to the maintenance and development committee and so while it is on our agenda again tonight uh in order for us to actually take it up we would need a referral back to the body uh from the maintenance and development committee is my understanding um in order for us to discuss it further this evening which uh, certainly warrants further discussion so i am gonna i'll make that motion um, not with a particular recommendation but just for discussion at the full body. The, the one question that I have, though, is relative to the actual language that appears on the order. The language last week was very confusing, as several counselors have spoken to. Um, and I think, Chris, you addressed that it was a, a poor copy and paste job because it included references to underground conduit location, Sylvan right. Street, which is nowhere yeah. near Fort. Now, I do see that the order that is on the agenda tonight uh, has been reconstructed and, and, and perhaps is a more appropriate uh, language for what's actually being asked. However, I, I am actually still a little confused as to what the exact order that's on the agenda tonight is actually asking us to do, um, because it indicates, you know, a, a closure from May to November, as you said, it doesn't list any years, but it also doesn't say that it would be permanent. So I guess I'm, I'm not completely understanding the consequence of voting the current order up or down uh, either way. Perhaps Ken or, or Chris, you could speak to this. And I know we do want to move on to the finance meeting. So maybe we have this discussion in the full body. But, um, but I, I, I do think the language that's presented and the discussion that's being had don't seem to be completely lined up. And so I'm hoping somebody can clarify that. Um, Jesse, could you just you 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 had a question buried in there about the I think the length of time of this of the petition for tonight? Yeah, the petition it's for tonight permanent. just says now, therefore, be it ordered that we will observe all of these, you know, all of these covenants that are pretty standard language. And it mentions in the body of it that it'll be from May to November. But Chris seems to be indicating the whole point of of the petition is so that they don't have to continuously come back to the city council. I guess I'm wondering 
that doesn't really seem to be reflected in the actual language that we're voting on. So I'm, I'm trying to fully understand the impact of a vote on this order. Say we did take the order up and we voted it down. What would happen? I, I understood Chris's position to be that he was going to simplify it and that next year that it would come again in front of the council and we would uh, be up or down as you're going to approve it next year from May 1st to November 1st. He was simply going to simplify the process and then get, I assume, get permission to do it from May 1st to November 1st, unless there was some major change. That was my understanding. Correct. So are they coming before us every year or not? That is not clear to me. I mean, and, and just for my purposes, Ken, I am looking for them to, I'm looking for the council to approve this so I do not have to go to the council every year. Okay. That it's going to grant them for May 1st to November 1st. They still have to go through the permitting process every year. Uh, and I can grant them a permit every year. But since this was going to be a repetitive thing, whether it's the port, excuse me, or any other business, rather than somebody saying, hey, you're doing this every year, you're kind of circumventing the rule, we decided we wanted to come before the council, show everybody what we're doing to be able to get that approval and go through the permitting process every year. All right. That's understood. Okay. Um, you quickly, City Councilor uh, Tracy Whitfield. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, and it will be quick. First, I just don't understand why this was a joint meeting because we knew that the fort was going to take up a majority of the time, but that was you guys' decision. Secondly, um, so I'm, I'm okay, just to clarify one more time, Chris is coming to us so that he doesn't have to come to the city council every year. He can just go ahead and do the approval process of these type of permits. And is this for just the fort, this petition, or it's in general, it, it becomes the rule for all organizations that um, are requesting outdoor dining? If I get a request from any other entity that wants to do the same thing, I'm gonna run them through the Board of Public Works process. And then do they have, if it's an extended period of time like this one, do they have to come to, to the city council? Would you have to do another petition just like this or a different yes. organization? Yes, so if somebody if else wants to do it. For example, I mentioned Asteria. If Asteria wants to move forward, I had said to them, I can grant them the temporary permit. However, I want you to go before the council to, if this is something you're gonna do every year, uh, that way the approvals can just then get taken care of in the spring of every year. So for right now, this is solely for this, this or for the Solely Ford. for Ford Street, correct. Okay. And so I just wanted to um, bring it to the council's attention that at times, a uh, butters may not go through the process. They may get the letter in the mail late. They may it may get lost. A uh, butters can change and move, and then they won't have any way to uh, stop this process from happening. Um, sometimes they come directly to counselors and voice their opinions on things that's happening on the street. They don't necessarily know who else to go to, and so even if they did that, we wouldn't have the authority to make any decisions. Um, on this because we have already given up our right to do so as a council, as a governing body. And so I just want us to be um, mindful that when we give up our governing authority, like something that is coming on later down the week, when we gave up all of our authority to figure out where our funds are going in one lump sum, now we don't have authority over how it's spent. So we need to think about situations like this that has happened in the future and be very cautious about giving away our authority to any any organization and it's not um it's not particular to the fort no no problem with the fort I, I like the fort as well um but I'm just saying in general and then we got to think about the petitions that come before us and if we say no you know <laughs> for for some other ones you know how is that going to look for us as a governing body so we need to keep some of those things in mind when we um make our decision thank you thank you thank you city councilor uh Whitfield into what Council President uh, Lederman, um, you're you're going to propose to move the petition to the council for a vote tonight. Is that my correct clear on that? 
in our capacity of forming a quorum yourself I'll, and myself. I'll, I'll make a motion to refer it back to the general body for further discussion, and then the council can make whatever decision it would like at the meeting tonight relative to how to move forward. Okay, if, if you can make so that I'll, motion. I'll, I'll make that motion at this time. I think there's further discussion to be had, and I, it sounds like there's an appetite for further discussion. If we don't refer it back to the body, there, there can't be further discussion this evening. So... So I'll make the motion to refer it back to the, the full body. And I will second that motion. And as we are the two members that constitute a quorum, that will be on the agenda for tonight and we can debate it further, further there. So thank you very much for the uh, discussion. And I think uh, there was some clarification, a lot of issues that need to be clarified. So thank you, uh, DPW Director Signoli and to the petitioners and Attorney Shea and to all the counselors involved. This concludes the maintenance and development portion of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, everybody. Now we are moving on to the finance items. We have 20 finance items tonight. I appreciate everybody hanging in there. Um, when I agreed to have the board items on on the finance page, I had no idea that it would take as long as it did. So we have, uh, there's no public speak out tonight, so we still have the better part of a half an hour to get through the finance items. So let's just, let's just start. We're pretty good at getting through these lately. So number one is the HUD Continuum of Care Grant. Is someone on to uh, speak to that? Yes, uh, Jerry McCafferty here, uh, Director of Housing. Um, this is an annual grant, 6.9 million this year. We apply for renewal every year. It funds multiple organizations throughout the city that are responding to homelessness, I'm sorry, throughout Hamden County. Um, we, The city is the recipient of funds for Hamden County for this federal grant. Um, the money flows through the city to a number of organizations that um, this is money for housing people, providing housing and services to people who have been homeless. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Anybody have any comments on that? Anybody have? Um, I, I'm not sure how I would see a raised hand looking at the screen, but just speak up if you would like to speak on it. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next one. All right, thank you, not hearing anybody. Next item is CDBG entitlement grant. Um, CD oh. uh, this is Kathy Bono and I'm here to speak on the CDBG grant. It is a yeah. yearly in yearly entitlement that the city receives from the um, from HUD, the federal government. Um, this year it is $3,752,266. It did go down $24,000, approximately $24,000 from last year. Um, which, it, you know, is only about 0.6%. So it isn't a big decrease, um, but it's it's used for um, public facilities, public services, housing. Um, so this is our standard annual EDBG grant, Kathy. Yes, it is. Yep. Great. Thank you. Uh, anybody want to speak on that? Just speak up if you do, because my back is to the screen. I do. Um, um, Kathy, so this entitlement grant, tell me the process of how it gets out to the community. And um, because in the, in the past years, you have been doing something on Facebook or um, something in the mayor's chamber, and it's not reaching a lot of people or a lot of organizations that want to apply for it. So can you tell me what that process looks like? The process we used for applying is the same we, we've used every year. Um, we during the month of February we put out an RFP for public service for 30 days. We also send um, a letter to all city department heads to asking if they if there's any projects uh, that they want funded, and we also have um, a an emergency repair program that's run by the Office of Housing, um, and they do their own outreach to let um, homeowners know what's available. Um, we do, we have been doing virtual meetings. It, it has stopped the, um, HUD just, to, um, let us know that they will no longer allow just virtual, that every community has to offer hybrid. So we're going to have to figure out that, that they want it both, um, be able to zoom in and be in person. So our next oh, hearing, man. which will be for our CAPER, our year-end report, will have to be, um, available hybrid. So that will start now. The hybrid meetings will start now and the application process isn't until February 2024? 
Correct. For because we have to have our funding in place and we have to send our it has to be available to public for 30 days. So during the month of April, we uh, made the plan available to the public and then we have to send it to HUD by May 15th and they have 45 days to um, to approve or ask questions. And how how are we getting this these public meetings out to the community, to residents in the community? We send out over 300 flyers. We also do outreach to all the communities and we make sure that all the people who have applied in the past are already made aware of it. But we have a, a substantial mailing list of about 300 uh, organizations and communities throughout the uh, throughout Springfield. So it goes to 300 organizations. Can, can you provide okay. that list? Sure, I can send you that list. Okay. And Thank any if counselors have any people that wanna be added to the list, by all means, just email me. Definitely. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, thanks, Trey. Councillor Whitfield. Uh, anybody else want to speak on this item? Just speak up. All right, not hearing anybody. We're all set on that one. Thank you, Kathy. Moving on to the next one, the home entitlement grant. Um, who will be speaking on this one? Jerry McCafferty again. Um, this is uh, similarly an entitlement grant from HUD. It is annual funds um, that is given to us based on a formula, $1.8 million this year. We use this money uh, to support um, creation of um, first time home buyer, uh, building of, of homes for first time home buyers. Uh, we use it for um, down payment and closing cost assistance. We use it to support uh, development of affordable housing. Um, and we use it for a small program that is um, tenant-based rental assistance. We partner with a community organization that provides supportive services in conjunction with this. This serves as rental assistance. And um, that program is specifically for disabled homeless individuals. So this money, Kathy, is for um, more people to take advantage of the first time home buyer. Is that fair? Is that fair to say? Um, it, it, it funds a number of things. Um, okay. Actually, in, in this year, we are carrying over money from last year for first time home buyer. So I'm sorry, I just misspoke in that um, because uh, home buying has been down, um, uh, we did not go through all of our money last year. So we're carrying over money. We're supporting really at this point, anyone who comes in for, anyone who's eligible who comes in for home, home buyer assistance, we still have funds for. Okay, thank you. Any Anybody have questions on this? Not hearing anybody, uh, let's move on to item four. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, this is the Mass Gaming Commission grant contract amendment to reimburse the police department cost of participation in the gaming enforcement unit. Will somebody speak to this? Anybody on who can speak to this grant? Yes, uh, Deputy Chief Lawrence Akins is here on behalf of the police department. Oh, great, thank you. Go okay, right ahead. Uh, thank you, go right ahead. Yes, in regard to the, uh, the award granted uh, by the Mass Gaming Commission, uh, to the Springfield Police Department Gaming Enforcement Unit uh, that's based out at MGM Casino. Uh, we've been awarded $1,089,359.27. Um, to, and it goes to uh, cover the costs associated with the Police Department Gaming Unit uh, for fiscal year 2024 for such things as salaries, benefits. Um, education, incentive pay, overtime, uniform clothing. And, um, you know, it covers one lieutenant and six patrol officers that are housed at MGM Casino uh, year round. And do we know if this uh, 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 officer, does this cover all the costs, you know, or is it supplement? I, I'm sorry. Does this cover all the costs of that unit? Or is yes. it just uh, Yes, this does. is. It's anticipated this should cover the cost for the year for the unit, yes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Anybody uh, have any comments or questions? I just have one comment. Um, I just wanted to um, congratulate you, Deputy Chief, on your um, uh, promotion to Deputy Chief. <laughs> Thank you, I know it's been a little while, but I, 
I, I didn't get a chance to do that. Well, thank you very much, Counselor. I appreciate that. Thank you. Nice job. That's great. Great news. Thank you. Um, okay, item five is a DPW transportation construction grant. Are you still on, Chris? Yes, I am. Uh, this is a grant through the Gaming Commission. We made application through their grant program for a construction uh, award. Uh, they give us one third of the funds. So in this case, it's 966,000. Uh, our project is going to be uh, Dwight Street downtown uh, from basically Worthington to State Street, uh, reworking curbs, sidewalks, uh, lane narrowing, bike lanes, pedestrian improvements, uh, et cetera. Uh, our award last year was for East and West Columbus Avenue for paving and enhancements, and that work will be starting um, in the next few weeks. Uh, this program for this project probably will not start till next construction season. So you're still doing the work that you were with last year's month. Yeah, yeah. Because of when we get it, it's hard to get it out into a project at this time of the year. Yeah. Okay. Chris, have you... Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I do have a question. Have you um, wrote for any grants for any other neighborhoods besides the downtown um, area? The uh, Yes, because we've been doing shared street stuff all over the place, Indian Orchard, uh, McKnight, um, and we got some up in uh, uh, Outer Belt, et cetera. This one is specifically gaming commission, so we have to tie it back into traffic associated with the casino. I got you. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Speak up. Uh, thanks, Tracy. Uh, let's move on to number six, HOPWA Entitlement Grant. I don't know who that ha has that, but somebody speak up, please. <laughs> Jerry McCafferty, um, Director of Housing. This is uh, the Federal Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS. The City of Springfield receives funding for the eligible metropolitan statistical area of Franklin, Hampshire and Hamden County. Um, so this we we administer the um, $833,000 for that entire area. It is, as the name says, it covers housing assistance for persons who are HIV positive or have AIDS, either rental assistance or assistance to prevent eviction. Is this handled by your office or is it does it get yes. parceled out to other towns? Oh, well? so it's uh, it's handled by the Office of Housing, but we um, fund three agencies uh, in the community that that actually provide the services. All right, great. Okay, thank you. Anybody, any questions? Thank you, Jerry. Um, moving on to number seven, the ESG Entitlement Grant. This one's also mine. <laughs> um, Emergency Solutions Grant. This is to provide uh, the emergency response to homelessness. So this uh, provides emergency shelter, um, but it also provides rental assistance and prevent uh, homelessness prevention. This is another grant that comes through the city. It is only to be spent in the city of Springfield, but it goes to multiple organizations in the city that um, carry out the services. Okay. Thank you. Just Jerry, just uh... When I saw ESG, that's a new acronym for environmental, social, governmental. That's a term in yep. uh, kind of business ethics to make sure that um, companies are contributing to the environment, to social issues. And Good. so yes. when, I, when I saw that, I was like, oh. oh uh, <laughs> HUD has been using it for this grant since the 90s. <laughs> so they were first. <laughs> so you're, you're in first. OK. Um, thank you. Um, Questions on that, anybody? Not hearing anybody. Uh, number eight, DPW Transportation Planning Grant, 250. Yeah, correct. That's also through the Gaming Commission for study and design. And the intersection that's being targeted is Union Street and Maple Street. Uh, one of the issues we have there is Milton Bradley School. Uh, the intersection is very substandard. So this grant's going to allow us to go through the design process. And with the goal is we make the application to the Gaming Commission for next year for the construction grant. So you would be improving one of those intersections or both right around Correct. Milton Bradley School. Yeah. Correct. It's yeah. a little tight, a little tight there with the coming through Maple uh, in the three o'clock time frame for sure. Yep. Um, okay, thanks, Chris. Um, DPW ride share funding. Chris, you're up again. 
Yep, this is the uh, grant we receive every year from the state. Uh, we call it Uber money. Basically, it is money coming back to all the communities in the state of the tax that are put on Uber and Lyft and those types of ride shares that are done in a municipality. We're getting uh, $58,000 this year. And basically, we've been using it to do sidewalk uh, ramp, uh, uh, handicap ramp work. This past year, the grant that we received, we did three major intersections in the McKnight area. Uh, so when we just got the grant, we haven't identified where that's going to be, but it's going to be something similar neighborhood based that requires a lot of uh, two or three or four locations where we can do some pretty good handicap uh, accessibility improvements. Great. Uh, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. All right. Number 10, fire last call foundation grant. Is that a fire department thing? Anybody here to speak on this? Hi, Councillor Allen. I can take that one. All right, Lindsay. Thanks. So this grant is $44,000 for the fire department. Um, and this is provided by the Last Call Foundation, whose mission is to provide funding, education, and research to advance the safety needs of the firefighting community. And this funding is exclusive to purchase pair uh, specific um, equipment for each of the 258 members of the fire department. Okay. So it's used for their own safety. Correct. Great, thank you. Will you be speaking on this tonight at the meeting, do you think? Probably. Yeah, okay, thank you. Me or, me or TJ will be there. All right, great. All right, number 11, state aid to public library increase. This is a small amount of money, but we'll take it. Um, go ahead, anybody? Sure. Uh, so this is an increase of just under $4,000 to the FY23 State Aid Award, bringing the total up to just over $500,000. Okay. We already had accepted the other part of it. Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, number 12. Amended appropriation order for taking damages for St. James Avenue at Tapley Street. Is that Chris or is that Lindsay? Um, this was Robert from the law department. I don't see he's on any longer. Um, he was here, but I'm sure he'll be at the seven. Okay, fair enough. From what I understand, this order has already been voted on. This was th There was just an error in the order, so they just need to bring it back. Okay. Same for the second. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, it was a long uh, first part of this meeting, so I understand if someone had to leave. Um, number 13, um, that was 12. Number 13, is that applied to that one as well? Yes. Okay. And 14, Community Preservation Fund. This is the order authorizing appropriations and reserves for it. So this isn't individual projects. This is just getting the money put away, put away, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, it's getting the money put into the specific buckets it needs to go to. I can't speak to it myself. I'm not sure who from the CPC will be here tonight. So the CPC, you mean their whole list of applications are on this agenda? Oh, nope. No, this is just for the FY24 budget, which is the breakdown of the their appropriation. Oh, okay. Thank God. Okay. Start a meeting on them, Tracy, as I understand, but this is just moving the money into the right place, the approvals. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's not tonight. Um, okay, now we got four items, 15, 16, 17, 18, that are all um, free cash. Uh, distributions, if you will. Could you speak to them, Lindsay? Sure. So there are four orders related to the remaining four free cash. Um, there is $17,591,479 that is remaining after all of the other appropriations we hope to get passed, which will be going to stabilization reserves. Um, so really, if we worked up from 18, 17, 16, 15, 15 is what's left after we Correct. do those under three, right? Yes. So, so 17,000, a million is what you're wanting to transfer to the stabilization reserve fund? Yes. 
but we took out 26 million last year to put in that account that gives us interest of 2 million to put toward um, property tax. Right. So we took money um, and we put it into the T-bills and the interest from that, which is about $2 million, will be put towards um, reducing tax bills in FY24. And but how, many, how many other years? As long as it continues to accrue interest, from my understanding. So is, so we will never take this money out of the T-bills, like the $26 million? I'm sorry? The $26 million that was put into the T-bill account is in perpetuity? Um, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know if we'll eventually be adding more money. I don't know if we'll take it out because interest rates are less favorable. Um, I don't know the answer to that specifically. Usually, isn't there a, a time limit on these type of accounts? Or it just sits there until you want to pull it out? So sometimes there is. Um, sometimes it's a specific like a year, and then you know that you're, you'll are you be earning a certain amount of interest within a year. Um, but sometimes you can leave it in. Okay, can you just get clarification on which kind this is? Yeah, TJ, TJ will be there at 7, so he'll be able to answer more specific questions about the T-bills. And so I just have a couple comments on the free cash, and you guys know I'm going to say it, but I guess the squeaky wheel gets the grease because I know that Counselor Allen has talked about pensions and OPEB, and he got some free cash into that. Um, so maybe if we talk about property tax, we'll do a little bit better. I understand that um, you want to use what three million or five or five million of free cash. I, I didn't five. Think it was five, five million. Five million, and then the two million to reduce the property tax rate, but the increase when I looked at the budget looked like there was 17 million. And this is the time that we're supposed to be talking about it because it's not gonna make a bit of difference when we set the tax rate in October because it's already gonna be set. And so I think that we took $26 million and we put it in a T-bill to earn some interest to help reduce that, but we could have done better. And now we wanna turn around and take 17 million and put it back into the stabilization reserves fund where we can actually use more of that to reduce the tax burden on our residents. When we can give away all this money to outdoor dining, I think we need to look at and consider doing more for the residents in the city of Springfield when we're able to. So um, while I want to support this, but is it on the agenda to move the $17 million to the Stabilization Reserves Fund? Is that on the agenda? Yes. Yes. And so we, we all, 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 four of the, all four of these items are on the agenda. No, I see, I, I'm, I, I'm on Zoom, so I will have to toggle back and forth to see it okay. um, on my computer. So I'm just trying to figure out um, why we're not doing more. If we can take 26 million out to put in T-bills, why are we not doing more for the residents of the city of Springfield into, instead of putting 17 million into the stabilization reserves? Are we trying to make up that 26 million that we took out for T-bills? Are we, are we trying to do that? No, we're just trying to grow our reserves. But we took 26 million out of the reserves. So No, it's still, I mean, it's still our money. We just put it in a, a different account. It's but still it's money. not in reserve, so it reduces our reserves amount, right? No, it doesn't reserve reduce our reserve. It's it's still in a bank account. It's still considered mm -hmm. reserves. It's still part of our overall fund balance. It's just in a different kind of account that earns more interest. That should have been explained. So it still shows in a reserve fund balance. It's still part of our reserve fund balance. Absolutely. What's our reserve fund balance? So right now it's just over fifty million. Fifty million. Where we need to be at to be at that five percent. Um, right amount. now we're at, at about six percent. Um, moving this money in would get us closer to eight, right? Eight or ten. Yeah. So I don't know if the finance department think it would be like great to have it at seven and do more for our residents of the city of Springfield when it comes to reducing the tax bill, but that's something that I would propose. Um, we could do a little bit more. We don't, I mean, the time is now, it's been what, eight, nine years of increases of the property tax bill year over year over year over year. And still we want to add another increase next year. And we always talk about this in October and we don't talk about it right now. And then October, the backlash comes to the city councilors when the tax bills go up. And so I think now is the time to talk about it, but I just wanted to say that for the record and I'll be saying it again in the um, full meeting. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so, Lindsay, these four items are, are, if I understand it, 25, two and a half million 
Uh, and by the way, I just got a, a note here from Susan that the meeting starts in five minutes. So uh, two and a half million suggested to go to roadway improvements, three million to go to neighborhood enhancements for neighborhoods that decide on things that they would like to do and enhance their neighborhood. Five million to tax relief, uh, in addition to the set the two million that was already there, and then seventeen point five million to go to free cash. Uh, excuse me, to go from free cash to the stabilization uh, as a protection. I believe a lot of it is a protection against um, the po the potential recession that a lot of people have been talking about. Um, so, um, so. So it's it's money, it's our money, and uh, that's one uh, that's the recommendation of we don't have to vote on it here, but those are what those four items are. Um, thank you for your comments, Councilor Whitfield. Can we go on to um, number nineteen budget transfer within the department? Could you explain that one, Lindsay, please? Sure. So this is an order that comes before council every year towards the end of the year, and this is to move money that we have set aside in FY23 for PAYGO projects um, that might not have been expended yet um, over to FY24. Those, so those projects, uh, excuse me, those projects can continue in FY24 if they're not completely, um, the funds are expended in FY23. So we're just moving money to to get PAYGO where we want it to start. The Correct. Year. It's just moving the FY23 PAYGO project funding over to a multi-year account out of the general fund so it doesn't get swept to free cash um, because then it's available in FY24 for those projects to continue. Okay. All right, thank you. That leaves two items. They're both bills of prior year. Um, they're small, let's say 11,003 and 2,600. Uh, you want to do a quick uh, description, Lindsay? We got to get in there in a minute. Yeah, sure. So um, the law bill of prior year is just for services rendered, um, consultant services rendered in um, FY21, $11,000. They do have funding in their FY23 budget to cover that cost. And then the following order is for $2,600 for the police department. Um, again, bills from FY22. Um, that we're just looking to use their FY23 appropriation to cover. Okay, thank you. Any questions, Councillor Whitfield? Well, maybe she left. So we got left here. Focus, focus, Lindsay Hackett, Kathy Buono. Did you have any questions, Kathy? No. Nope. Nothing, nope. Okay, thanks. And Justin and Paul Tuggill, I guess we got through it. In a half an hour, we didn't have much time, but we, we get through it. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in the regular meeting in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Thank you.